Hi, I'm the Sandman, and we need to talk about Saturnine. Mortis actually went on pre-order this weekend, so well done if you beat the scalpers, but let's make sure everybody's on the same page for where all the characters are at this point in the story. There's actually so much that happens in this book, we're not gonna be able to cover all of it. So today I thought we would just go over the Primarch interactions and where they are currently. So up first, let's talk about Jagatai Khan. Jagatai Khan actually hasn't featured too much in the Siege so far, including in Saturnite, but we do get some really cool moments. For example, we we know that Jagatai respects his brother Dawn, but doesn't always listen to everything he says. And if he wants to get on a bike, ride off with the white scars and go save a bunch of people, he's gonna go and do that. It's also very notable that he does that because lots of the Primarchs are very self-centered. They have a kind of a disregard for human life. I guess that's something they inherited from the Emperor. So we also have a fantastic little subplot. This is a subplot that revolves around one of Dawn's top generals. And so what happens is at a meeting, Jagatai overhears this general talk at Dawn's expense. And Jagatai flies into a fit of rage at this, and he's quite angry. And this is really uncharacteristic for Jagatai, because normally Jagatai is the smartest, one of the smartest, and one of the most level-headed of all the Primarchs. This is really interesting. Okay, and, and he sends this general to the front lines, which is tantamount to a death sentence at this point in the siege. And Dawn finds out about this, and he's like, like, hey, like, I really like this guy. He finds the general. He's like, yo, you don't need to go to the front lines. It's cool, which is also really nice about Dawn because we see he, he cares about the people that he works with. But the general gives an interesting response. The general says, no, it's fine. I'm happy to go to the front lines. And we actually realize that what has happened is Jagatai has recognized kind of a kindred spirit in this general. And this is a general that has spent his life fighting for the Imperium, fighting for humanity. And if he's gonna die at the Siege of Terror, he's gonna die on the front lines fighting with the brave men and women who have fought and dying for this planet. And of course, Sanguinius features heavily in this book. He is flying around, taking names. He's doing incredibly well. He actually takes down a Warlord Titan it's as awesome as it sounds. Yeah, if you haven't read that bit, do read it. It's just, read it again if you've read it already. It's just fantastic. I do have one ever so tiny gripe with Sanguinius at the moment. It's only a little thing, and don't get me wrong, if I found out my brother was gonna kill me at some point, that would probably get to me. But Sanguinius is ultimately, for me, just a bit too sad at this stage in the heresy. So he, we've had an entire heresy where he has been traumatized by his impending doom. But at this point, We've had him supposedly kind of deal with that fact at multiple books, and now it's kind of like, no, seriously, can we just get an entire book of Sanguinius flying around, killing Warlord Titans? I just want to read that book, to be honest. And now we've got to talk about Rogel Dawn, who has gone up so much in my estimations of what a cool Primarch is. So originally, I think like a lot of people, I wasn't particularly fussed with Dawn. He's very similar to a bunch of other Primarchs, nothing really stands out about him, and he's mean to Garrow. I really like Arrow, just don't be mean to him. He's also mean to Sigismund, and Sigismund's also pretty cool. But in Praetorian of Dawn, this pretty much changed for me. So what happens in Praetorian of Dawn is we discover one of the key gifts that uh, Dawn has, and one of the things that makes him such a good Praetorian. So towards the latter half of the book, Dawn fights Alpharius, which is a Primarch fight. So it's always going to be awesome, but it's particularly awesome because we find something out really key about Dawn. And that is that one of his gifts is his ability to analyze and find the weaknesses in his brother, which makes him a particularly good protector of the Emperor. And this manifests in the in the scene when Rogel Dawn walks into a room and he immediately picks out Alpharius, who has disguised himself amongst his legionaries as he normally does. And we realize that he can do this for many Primarchs. And this also comes up in Saturnine. So in Saturnine, Fulgrim properly enters the siege. He leads the ground assault at Saturnine with the other Emperor's children. And originally, Sigismund runs up to him and Fulgrim quite literally slaps the guy. It's, it is quite funny. It is just quite funny. But what then happens is Dawn runs out and Dawn has an epic line. Sigismund's courage sometimes outstrips his sensibilities. Mine doesn't. And it's just amazing. <laughs> Now, there are a huge number of lists across the internet that will rank the Primarchs on their combat prowess. And pretty much most of them, I'd imagine, would put Fulgrim above Dawn. And that's very good reason to do so. So Fulgrim is the Phoenician. He is a demon Primarch and a master swordsman. Dawn is a guy that really likes Lego. Okay, so there's you'd assume that Fulgrim has got this fight in the bag. However, Dawn, now able to kind of properly utilize this gift, 
can really capitalize against Fulgrim. So Fulgrim, for all his many strengths, has some really big weaknesses and Dawn exploits them. Oh boy, does he exploit them. So this kind of begs the question, is there anyone that Dawn couldn't beat out of the Primarchs? Because he knows most of them pretty well. But I guess there are some that he doesn't know so well. So Jagatai, you know, very famously is said by Sanguinius to maybe even be the strongest Primarch. The Primarchs have no way of knowing because Jagatai is so withdrawn. Likewise, there are Primarchs like the Lion who they just don't know that well. So it's super interesting to me, this idea of like who could Dawn take on using this kind of capability. Dawn also has a really cool moment in this book. He actually realizes that he can lie to Sanguinius. And it's quite funny because he really surprises himself with this revelation because he lies to Sanguinius and pretends he didn't know that Vulcan was already there at um, Terra, which obviously we know that Dawn and Vulcan have already met because they have a what is a very emotional and heart heartwarming uh, reunion uh, at the Imperial Palace. Dawn also starts the Inquisition, which is interesting. It's super cool. It's, it's not necessarily a retcon. It doesn't really change anything. The Inquisition was always kind of shrouded in mystery, but now we find out where that eye comes from. Everyone can assume it might have been something to Malkador, but actually now we know. The remembrances were disbanded because why would Terra want the events of the biggest tragedy to ever befall humanity to be recorded? However, Dawn realizes that actually there are a huge number of noble deeds and important things and lessons that need to be recalled from these times. So he restarts the remembrances and calls them the interrogators. And that's where they get the famous eye from. We also have an epic back-to-back -back fight between Dawn and Sigismund, which is just really, really cool. And Dawn actually stabs Eidolon throws him off the walls of, of terror. And I hate Eidolon, so God, I loved that. <laughs> so whilst we're on the Emperor's Children, let's just talk about Fulgrim because we get a good display of him in this book. So we see that he's actually quite psychically powerful by this point. He demonstrates this by kind of changing his shape at will, as you'd imagine a demon Primarch could do. But Fulgrim does what we always knew he was going to do in the siege, which is turn tail and run. This is a really important point of law and it's something that impacts 40k also. So for those of you that aren't familiar, even in 40k, lots of the traitor legions really hate the Emperor's children. And there's two reasons for this. Number one, they're really weird. But number two, they betrayed all the other Chaos Legions at the Siege of Terror because they they just leave early and this is always held against them. Horus Lupercal is also obviously in the book. He is doing what we'd expect him to be doing at this point. He is doing really weird things in this reality, but in the warp, he is fighting the Emperor. We don't know how that fight is going. We can kind of make some guesses because of how things are impacting the battle, but it looks like he's making okay pro progress at bringing down the psychic defenses of the Emperor. And now to aid him with a bit of psychic might, Magnus has finally properly showed up at the Siege of Terror. This is always really going to be important for the Chaos side because they need their powerful big red giant. However, one of the most interesting things about Magnus is his interactions with Mortarion in this book. So the thing is about Magnus and Mortarion is they traditionally don't get along due to them being on opposing sides at the Council of Nikea. However, being a demon Primarch, it's quite hard for Mortarion to now take the stance that all warp things are evil and should never be used, considering he is basically one of them. So Magnus actually offers to teach Mortarion how to properly use all the nergly, disgusting gifts that he has now gotten. And he actually uses his psychic power to lessen the pain that Motarian has been in ever since he's been a demon Primarch. It also looks like we're working towards a Mortarian Jagatai fight, which I think everybody wants to see. All I can hope is that Jagatai rides into that fight on the back of a rhino, like he didn't like that old kind of standing law. Um, and actually, as we still don't have the Jagatai model, if Forge would want to make that model so it fits onto the back of a rhino, I'm just saying Games Workshop, you can have that idea from me. And so now we need to talk about Perturabo, but in order to talk about Perturabo, I need to talk about Abaddon. I know I said this video was going to be about Primarchs, but A, Abaddon is kind of a Primarch at this point in 40k, and B, it's my video, so I get to do what I want. So Abaddon actually gets his character development in this series, and by that what I'm referring to is his turning away from Horus Lupercal, because that's one of the things that always shocks me in the Abaddon series, is that by the time we meet Abaddon in Talon of Horus, the gang realizes that he's already turned his back on his gene father, and actually he's trying to turn them against their gene fathers. 
which is super interesting because when did this happen? I assumed that that first book would be the breaking down and rebuilding of Abaddon and I was wrong. He actually takes no qualms at all with just destroying the clone of his gene father. And so we've had more in this series of Abaddon seeing Horus and seeing that he's made a bad decision to give into chaos as much as he has done. And actually he will be better off leading as Horus Lupercal as he was. So Abaddon has learned that he can use chaos without properly giving into it like Horus has. And so his relationship with Zadu Leic has shown him that there are some incredibly powerful parts to the Chaos Pantheon, but you don't want to properly take everything you can from chaos because it will only come back to haunt you in the long run. And in 40K, we know how this has manifested. So in 40K, at this point, Abaddon has managed to bring onto his side basically every demon Primarch. Now, interestingly, he has a go at manipulating the Primarchs in this book, and this is where we talk about him and Perturabo. So if you're not familiar, you've forgotten, one of the key parts of Sazenai is the discovery of some tunnels underneath the Imperial Palace. And Perturabo realizes that they could send through a special attack force and maybe cut the head off the Imperial forces, massively weaken them. There's a huge amount of opportunity there. And Abaddon, at this point, leading the Jesterian, who specialize in being the spear tip, want to head this assault. And so Abaddon tries to manipulate Perturabo into doing so, and Perturabo flies into a fit of rage and ultimately says, fine. Okay, and lets him do it. However, Abaddon later finds out that Dawn was actually well aware of these duck tunnels also and has set an elaborate trap. Pert Rabo, on the other hand, had assumed Dawn would be aware and so was happy to send the Jesteria in. And it was all a feint because either he win, Abaddon is successful and they cut the head off the snake, or Abaddon dies and he's not too fussed. And it's things like this, which is why Perturabo has gone up so much in my estimations of the Primarchs. We've had some really epic moments from him. For example, he has beaten Dawn at multiple points in the series so far. So for example, he used Kruger, this kind of rash general of his, against Dawn because Dawn wouldn't be able to predict his movements. And these kind of things have worked. What's super interesting is that we don't know what's going to happen between now and the Iron Cage to make Perturabo want to be a demon Primarch because he's quite similar to Abaddon in that he can see Horus and see the negative effects of giving in to chaos as Horus has done. So we know that Perturabo does enough to become a demon Primarch, but why would he want to be one? So last but not least, we have to talk about my boy, Lion L. Johnson, who is technically not in the book. But <laughs> this book is really important for the Lion and Dark Angels fans. So there are two really big complaints people have about the Lion. Number one is that half his legion turned to chaos, which is quite a good point, to be fair. But number two is answered in this book. So people rightfully point out, hey, where was the Lion at the Siege of Terror? And there's always been an answer to that, which was that he was destroying traitor homeworlds, which is nice. I guess it's a nice gesture, but it doesn't really do much, does it? Actually, it does. So in Maelstorm, the lion finds out something that we as readers all know, which is that the warp is a cruel reflection of what happens in this reality. And he discovers this by um, sentencing a planet to exterminators. And then after the planet is destroyed, he realizes that the demon forces nearby are weakened and ultimately him, Rebute Gilliman, can send Sangonius through to terror. And at this point, he uses this lesson to realize that if he can't get through to terror, what he can do is go and destroy the traitor homeworld and that will massively weaken the traitor forces at the siege. And we discover that this has come through to great effect through the eyes of Sanguinius. So Sanguinius can see through the eyes of Angron through lots of the book and we realize that a lot of the morale of the traitor legions is being broken and this is a huge deal because now there are two big forces on Horus Lupercal. Number one, he has to worry about our favorite blueberry, Rebute Gilliman, coming to support the Loyalists with the huge might of the 13th Legion. But number two, Horus now knows he can only hold the traitor forces together so long because even the Champion of Chaos cannot control all of these raging berserkers and selfish Slaanesh people. <laughs> and so he has really got two big time pressures on him. 
And so as a Lion fan, this is really great for me, this book, because now when people say, hey, where was the Lion at the Siege of Terror? I can say, hey, he is doing something that, whilst not directly impacting the story, did have a significant impact. Ha. So that's all I'm going to cover in this book. I think the people that have read Saturn are all going to be like, how have you not talked about these 50 things that all happened in the book and are really significant? And to be honest, the only answer for that is because so much happens in this book. I just can't cover all of it in one video without that video being incredibly long. But obviously, I would like to make a second video where I talk about lots of the other things that have happened in this book. For example, Neo, the, who we find out is now a thing, which is interesting. And the keen-eyed amongst you would have noticed that this is actually my first ever video. This book is actually so interesting to me that I was like, I have to make a video and a YouTube channel to talk about this to the camera. So yeah, please do like and subscribe and all that stuff. I've literally never done this before. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching and happy hobbying.